um, delivery to begin with. Um, but I've just got five minutes in which I'm going to touch on some things which I think indicate that we have an untapped ability to make change at speed and potentially scale that can get us out of this mess. And I'm going to be speaking from the evidence base of the Rapid Transition Alliance, which, which the SGR is a member of. Their tagline is evidence-based hope. And um, all the things that I'm going to be speaking to are elaborated on on their website, which is rapidtransition.org. They're an alliance of about 160 plus organizations. They address the question of why is it that we cling to business as usual so tenaciously with the kind of false solutions that we heard about before? And um, one of the reasons we believe is that it's been said for such a long time that it's been easier to imagine the end of the world than it has a fundamental change to the economic system that we have around us. But I want to argue really quickly that that is no longer the case and that one of the single and most important lessons of just the last few years and from many other times of upheaval under very different circumstances, that in spite of locked in social norms, economic path dependencies and cultural lock ins, that the last couple of years of the pandemic have revealed not just the cracks in the system and the inequality of impact when things do go wrong, whether it's based upon your income or your gender your, or your ethnicity, that we've revealed an extraordinary and comprehensive latent capacity for rapid adaptation and indeed mutual care. And that if we look at the pandemic, um, we see examples of behavior change, um, a much higher adherence to public health measures than many governments in the UK and the US even expected, an ability to change our lives for um, the protection of others virtually overnight. Again, virtually overnight, we've demonstrated the ability to redesign our urban infrastructure, to prioritize active travel, walking and cycling over cars, and our ability to leave cars in the garage and just get around using other ways not to mention rediscovering the importance of urban nature, for example, and the fact that children might be able to play safely again on, on pavements. We saw rapid changes to our working patterns. We discovered that when push came to shove, um, far from there being no magic money tree, um, the state can indeed, through furlough schemes, become even a wage payer of last resort and direct support at the areas of the productive economy that need it. Obviously, it could have been done much, much, much better, but it demonstrates the fact that austerity has, is and always has been a political choice. Um, we even saw examples of the way in which addressing the sort of the questions of equity and people being exposed literally to the elements that street homelessness could be ended with a concerted effort and was done so for a, a, a compressed period of time until the schemes supporting the ending of street homelessness were withdrawn. Um, we've seen the ability quite simply to put public interest and public health before private profit. We've seen the ability to redirect um, R&D into necessary emergency um, uh, research and development in the health sector. We've seen, we saw extraordinarily scientific acceleration in the vaccination research programs. We even saw examples of incredibly rapid industrial conversion, whether that was you know, Formula One motor engineers reapplying their skills to the making of low cost breathing aids or whether it was the brewing industry producing hand sanitizer or the fast fashion industry turning to making personal and protective equipment. We also saw some really profound attitudinal changes and new um, measures introduced to ensure that vulnerable people had protected access to the shops that were still open at the height of the lockdown and e even effective rationing. And we saw a scheme from the supermarkets in which they exhorted us quite extraordinarily to buy only what you need, which you might think is good advice at any time, whether you're in a pandemic or not. We also saw some really big cultural changes when spending more time at home, we rediscovered cooking. And when you cook at home, there's usually much less waste involved than when you're sort of um, sort of eating, e e eating out. A lot of reskilling in terms of kind of mending things. We shopped less, our consumption rates went down, and we kind of reskilled. We even made our own entertainment. That's not to say these things were easy, but it is to say that we demonstrated in a really compressed period, not only just innovative economic policy, infrastructure change, and behavior change, and shifts in consumption patterns. So, um, and I think one of the most things I've been most proud of looking at locally was the growth of mutual aid groups as well, 40% of which, according to a recent study, are still active. And you contrast that with some of the ways in which 
traffic um, traffic reduction schemes in some areas under certain political administrations were sort of given up even before pilot periods were um, uh, were, 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 were up. So. Um, uh, there are many, many more examples of this that you can kind of look into, whether it's the kind of the growth of the railways in Britain or the emergence of the NHS in a compressed period of time after the experience of collective action during the Second World War and the social housing building programmes, or even uh, to give a really direct example, forgotten examples like how Britain switched from town to natural gas in the space of just 18 years, uh, changing the technologies within 17 million households and 40 million appliances is often forgotten too in terms of our belief in the ability to make things happen quickly that only two generations ago, one in four homes in England and Wales still lacked an indoor shower and bath or toilet. And in just over two decades, that fell to 1%. So the point here is, and you can see it now with the rise in interest and, 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 and scaling out of the heat pump, is that um, change is possible. So I just want to kind of finish and wrap up really quickly in my spot with um, the words of Antonio Guterres, who, if you try to create change and you push against the status quo, you tend to get called a dangerous radical. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, made the point that climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals, but the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. And he says that investing in new fossil fuel infrastructures is a moral and economic madness. So, um, I'll finish there. That was my potted whirlwind tour. All that information is back 